And for D Bob Kyle's sake, of course, um, looking at IgMM gus, the precursor condition of Waldenstrom's, it was absent. Um, there was one patient who was positive who then turned out to be progressing to Waldenstrom's. And it was also absent in myeloma patients. Now, even more excitingly, this um, mutation actually stimulates the growth and survival signaling um, through the NF-kappa-B pathway. And what we've done is in our um, laboratory, using very sophisticated genetic knockdown techniques, we've actually been able to knock down specifically this mutation and cause the Waldenstrom cells uh, to undergo cell death. And so I just want to show you now perhaps what will be the most exciting slide that I'm going to share with you. And this is uh, something that hasn't occurred in 70 years in this disease, and that is specific drug targeting of the Waldenstrom's mutant protein. And this is actually a drug that's been developed that actually can hit the, uh, the actual uh, mutation pathway. And much like I showed you earlier with the apoptosis uh, figures that I shared with you for GA101, you know, you look here at the baseline uh, tumor cell killing uh, or death with uh, cells that aren't treated. You look at a control agent that we use, very little happens. And look what happens here when you're able to specifically uh, hit uh, this uh, mutation. And what you see is uh, very abrupt and, uh, you know, incredible uh, cell killing. And so to summarize um, my talk, familial predisposition is common in Waldenstrom's and impacts therapy. There are a number of options, including bendamustine, bortezomib, cyclophosphamide, and thalidomide-based therapies that can be considered for the symptomatic patient. The use of nucleoside analogs, as I mentioned, fludarabine or cladribine, should be carefully weighed against these other options given the uh, long-term risk concerns. I mentioned that better categorical responses are associated with better progression-free survival, time that the disease is kept in check, and it may actually reflect the patient's underlying genomic uh, construction. And then finally, genomic investigation has revealed novel targets uh, for the therapy of Waldenstrom's, and I hope eventually for the cure of this disease. As I summarize here, I think it's very important to put into context both the efforts of the IWMF as well as uh, many investigators across uh, this world. And I want to quote a local poet who said, do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. And I think this very nicely summarizes the efforts of the IWMF and countless investigators who are working on behalf of patients with Waldenstrom's. And with that, I'll conclude and uh, thank you for your kind attention. Uh, we have some time for some questions, so maybe we'll start right here. So, so the downstream proteins in the PCI32765 pathway uh, are usually very selective for B cells. So when you look at the receptor that's active here, it's actually found on more mature B cells. And there are a number of uh, proteins, and actually there have been efforts to try to target other members of this, uh, of this signaling pathway. Some of them, unfortunately, are shared by other uh, cell types like T cells, and if you and if you hurt T cells, it's a bad thing because you can, you know, then put the patient at risk for recurrent infections. BTK, on the other hand, is very specific for B cells, and as such, it would be a very selective target for Waldenstrom's. I would agree, a hundred percent. Yeah. So, I mean, when you look at the. Um, when you look at the test um, that's been uh, developed for um, rituximab uh, genomics, uh, it, it transcends because we use rituxan practically in every combination that we use in patients with, uh, with Waldenstrom's. But it's been a lot more difficult to try to, you know, come up with algorithms to test a particular, you know, other uh, agent in combination. There have been some efforts with uh, bortezomib which are evolving in Holland um, that may be uh, predictive, but uh, those algorithms still haven't been tested. And the only FDA-approved uh, product that's out there is that for rituximab genomic testing in patients with indolent diseases like Waldenstrom's. Any others? Uh, right. Yeah, it's an excellent question. You know, the, the problem with being able, and I'll just put that slide up, so if you're going dizzy, just close your eyes for a second. Um, you know, when you look at uh, familial predisposition, you know, in a quarter of the patients, as I mentioned, you can identify it. In the other, you know, three quarters, we really don't have, um, you know, a, a basis for it. 
And there have been a number of studies, including that from Ola Langren and Sigmund um, uh, Christensen, that have tried to tie together other types of predispositions. Autoimmune diseases, for instance, uh, pesticides, you know, have been also, you know, linked through these studies. But these are relatively, you know, low-level links, you know, to predisposition. The one thing that sometimes, you know, gets amiss here is that there could very well have been other events in an individual's family, um, but one may not know that. And the reason why I can say that is because when we looked at this patient population, you know, six years ago, the rate was about 19% of the patients had a first or second degree relative with a B cell malignancy. Well, guess what? In the subsequent six years, as those patients were coming back, they were saying, hey, you know, my sister just got diagnosed with Waldenstrom. So other events started happening. And so this is what really drove up this uh, figure to 26% is, is time. So that's one of the variables that I think, you know, we need to appreciate. The other, of course, is that, um, you know, just having the predisposition doesn't always mean that you're going to get the Waldenstroms. I've had uh, scenarios where I've seen the, um, you know, the child well before the, 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 the parent. In fact, you know, a parent that was 30 years older than the child actually declared themselves only after we went investigating, you know, why this very young individual had, had Waldenstroms. And so, you know, there has to be other hits perhaps along the way that actually move the disease along and, uh, you know, turn it from being asymptomatic to symptomatic. Just uh, maybe two more uh, gentlemen than back there. No. So, so I mean, bo both, there's no right answer, you know, to both of your excellent questions, which is something we struggle with at all our meetings as well. Um, if there was a way to actually change the course of history today, you know, I would say, you know, go and get everybody tested in your family. But we still don't have that ability yet. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't go look for it as, uh, as scientists, because you know, being able to now have a better sense of what the familial structure and predisposition is will allow us the opportunity to develop those kinds of diagnostic tools and hopefully, you know, create the medicines that may actually prevent the disease. I actually think whole genome uh, science presents a very unique opportunity to all of us. It's also potentially Pandora's box. But all of us in this room, within a few more years, will be able to get our entire genome sequenced for very little money, probably less than $1,000. You probably can even drop off your samples at Walgreens or CVS. Uh, <clears throat> I would not be surprised. But here's the issue. The issue is you're going to get a report that will tell you what your predisposition is to all kinds of diseases. And how do you handle that information? Well, let me tell you something. I met one day with a Nobel laureate in uh, genetics, a very close friend, who I said, you know, I need your help with this disease called Waldenstrom's, which she knew all about and was very helpful. Um, but she was also quite frazzled that day. And I tried to figure out why she was so frazzled, because I've known her for a long time. And as it turned out, she just had gotten her sequencing results that showed her predisposed to thyroid cancer. And that day, she was off to go get her thyroid scanned. And what I said to myself was, well, look, here's, here's somebody who's clearly in the field and has obviously been disturbed by this kind of uh, data. And again, predisposition doesn't always imply that you're going to have the disease. And thankfully, neither did she that day. Um, but how do we handle that information? And if you put it into context, you know, what's it going to do to our already very challenged health system when all of us start showing up demanding every test to be done? So we need to keep that in mind. Now, on the other hand, it also offers us opportunity because we can now look prospectively in the future. And I really hope one day that what are now cancer treatment hospitals will become cancer prevention hospitals because of that knowledge. So our last question is that patient lady back there, she, she'd been After I'll asking get you. A, yes. Yeah, well, um, to, to, that's exactly the point that I was making earlier is that as time is evolving and we see the same patients coming back, that we are seeing other events uh, in those families. And we went from a 19% you know, familial rate to 26% in something a little bit more than maybe six or seven years' time that we've seen this kind of evolution. Now, the other thing that may be actually also uh, important in terms of shedding some light on this is this genomics project. When we actually look to see if other members in the family had a monoclonal protein to IgM, uh, and for that matter, other types of monoclonal proteins, uh, what we saw was that particularly among those families that had the Waldenstrom's only phenotype, up to a quarter of those family members who had never been 
diagnosed before actually had the IgM monoclonal protein. And so that tells us is that this does run, you know, in these families, but really for most individuals it's still fairly quiescent and maybe another event comes along that then kicks, uh, you know, kicks it up. There's, a, there's somebody very, who's... Well, that, this has to be... So, so let me, there's, there's two good questions that are buried in your one question. Um, for starters, bortezomib should be considered an upfront therapy choice. And uh, that's based on data that's already accrued, but also it's in the NCCN guidelines. So it's an option, even upfront. Um, the other is, you know, I think one has to be a little bit careful because, you know, this study that actually showed that bortezomib did better for the patients that are familial is based still on a, a relatively small sample size, only 36 patients here. But nonetheless, the data, you know, were, were quite impressive. And I think also, you know, prospective studies, you know, are always nice to have. But, you know, in, in this disease, again, these numbers are probably not going to materialize to be able to do these large kind of studies, particularly if you segue out familial versus sporadic patients. For the time being, though, I mean, the data is what it is and needs to be reflected on on an individual basis. All right, so uh, please thank, uh, join me in thanking Dr. Trahan for presenting us.